In this video, we're taking a look at Le Chatelier's principle in the unit on chemical equilibrium. The principle stated is that when a disturbance or stress is applied to an equilibrium system, so a system already at equilibrium, the system responds by shifting in order to reduce the stress and re-establish a new equilibrium. It can shift forwards or it can shift backwards, to the right or to the left. If it shifts to the for in the forward direction, then it's going to make more products. Anything there that's gaseous or aqueous will have an increase in concentration, while any gases or aqueous reactants will decrease in concentration. Anything on the product side will increase in amount. Anything on the reactant side will decrease in amount. If it were to shift backwards, a reverse shift, shift to the left, then the opposite happens. Everything on the left-hand side will increase in amount. Everything on the right-hand side will decrease in amount. Concentrations on the left of gases or aqueous species will increase. Concentrations of aqueous or ga species or ga gaseous species will decrease on the left. Now you might notice I'm stressing concentrations only apply to gases and um, aqueous things in terms of changing. That's because concentrations of solids or liquids are considered to be constant. They don't change. So when you add more solid or you produce some liquid, the concentration does not change. Um, the amount changes, so you'll have a greater mass, you'll have a greater number of moles, but the concentration is not affected. Therefore, when you add or remove liquids or solids, um, no change in concentration occurs, and therefore no shift in equilibrium occurs. The types of things that qualify as stresses include concentration changes, so for gases or aqueous species, temperature changes, or volume changes. Volume changes which results in changes in pressure for gases in the system. So let's take a look at an example of a multi-step problem. Alright, so we've got a balanced equation involving a heterogeneous equilibrium. I can tell it's heterogeneous because it has gases, most of the substances are gases, but then there's this one solid substance. If you have more than one phase in a chemical reaction, it's considered a heterogeneous reaction. If all the phases are the same, for example, if these were all gases, then it would be a homogeneous equilibrium. Um, this, the question says the system is in a closed, rigid vessel, rigid so the volume does not change for the, for the vessel, it can't expand or contract. Now we can um, control the volume ourselves, perhaps there's a piston involved, like a syringe with a piston in it, we can reduce or, de or increase the volume, but the system itself cannot. It's closed because you must have a closed system to have equilibrium. If the reactants or products can escape from the system, then you won't have an equilibrium established. So we want to know what happens to the amount of SO3 in the system if we do a variety of things. Now let's look where SO3 is. It's on the left side of the equation. Um, we notice, therefore, that anything that causes this equilibrium to shift backwards will create more SO3. The amount of SO3 would increase if there were a reverse shift. Anything that causes a forward shift in the equilibrium will use up some of the SO3, and that's because it's a product in the reverse rate reaction, but a reactant in the forward reaction. Products get produced and reactants get used up. Notice that the word heat is written in the equation, and it's written on the left-hand side. Because it's on the left-hand side, this reaction is endothermic. Endothermic meaning that the forward rate reaction absorbs heat. The reverse reaction would be exothermic. The reverse reaction would produce some heat. So let's jump in. Now I'm going to talk these through. If this was a multiple choice question, um, we would simply think it through in our head and select an answer. If it's a free response question, you'll probably have to explain your answer and point form would be fine. So when I talk it through, I'll try to talk it through in a point form way. So let's see what happens to the amount of SO3 if we add some CO2. Well, the first thing I'm going to check is, is that a trick? Because 
if the CO2 was a solid or a liquid, there'd be no effect because the solids and liquids do not affect equilibrium. In this case, we're talking about a gas being added, so there will be an effect on the equilibrium. If you add some CO2, what's going to happen? Well, I'll explain this in three quick ways. The first method that I'll explain with is good for a pre-AP, a non-AP, um, grade 12 chemistry kind of answer. It would go something like this. If you add some CO2, the system will try to reduce the amount of CO2. The system will try to get rid of some of the extra CO2 that's been added. Now I look at my equation and I notice CO2 is on the left. Therefore, if it's trying to get rid of the CO2, there will be a forward shift in equilibrium. A forward shift is up everything on the left-hand side. Now that I've established that there will be a forward shift, I can say the amount of SO3 would decrease. So there you've got it, three basic points. The system added CO2, so my answer would first say that we'll try to get rid of the extra CO2. Then I'll say by shifting in the forward direction. And then finally I'll say the amount of SO3 decreases. Another way to explain what would happen there would be from a kinetics perspective. This would be good on an AP exam. If you add some CO2, notice that the CO2 is a reactant in the forward reaction. So therefore the rate of the forward reaction increases while the reverse rate is unaffected. Because the forward rate has been increased, there will be a forward shift to the equilibrium and the amount of SO3 would decrease. A third way to explain it goes to the reaction quotient, Q. In this reaction, that would be concentration of oxygen, the product that's gaseous, to the power of 4, divided by concentration of CO2 and concentration of SO3 squared. So it's the same expression in the reaction quotient as the equilibrium expression. Now, if you were at equilibrium originally, then Q was equal to K before we applied a stress. Well, what happens if we add some CO2? If you add CO2, then the denominator of Q gets larger, and therefore Q will get smaller. So that's the first thing I'd say, that increasing the concentration of CO2 causes Q to get smaller. So now Q is less than KC, and therefore there will be a forward shift to the equilibrium. If there's a forward shift, the SO3 gets used up. The second stress, or the second potential stress, is added CS2. See if you can pause the video and explain that yourself. Now, I hope you didn't get caught, caught up in that little trap here. The CS2 is a solid substance. It does not appear in the expression for Q. So, because its concentration is constant. So adding some more CS2 has no effect on equilibrium because it's a solid. You could explain it from Q by saying adding CS2 has no effect on the value of Q because the solid is, is not part of the expression for Q. Therefore, Q is still equal to Kc. There's no shift. From a kinetics perspective, you could argue that CS2 is a reactant in the reverse reaction, but it's a solid, so its concentration is constant. Adding more CS2 does nothing to the reverse rate and does nothing to the forward rate, therefore there's no effect on equilibrium. What happens if you remove some oxygen? Well, from a non-AP perspective, you could argue that the system will try to make some more oxygen. It's going to try to replace the oxygen that you removed. Um, to make more oxygen, it will shift in the forward direction, where oxygen is a product, and therefore the amount of SO3 in the container will decrease. From an equilibrium Q perspective, we could argue that the oxygen's removal will cause Q to get smaller, because oxygen's in the numerator, Q will decrease. Therefore, Q will be less than Kc, and that will cause a forward reaction shift, and therefore you'll have less SO3. From a kinetics perspective, removing the oxygen slows down the reverse reaction rate, because oxygen's a reactant in the reverse reaction. If you decrease its concentration, you decrease the rate of the reverse reaction. So now the forward reaction rate is faster than the reverse. There'll be a forward shift, and you'll have less SO3. 
if the system is heated, a little typo there, what happens if the system is heated? Well, from a non-AP perspective, we could argue that heat, because it's an endothermic reaction, heats on the left-hand side, so we can treat it like a reactant. If we heat the system, we've added heat, the system would like to use up some of the extra heat. To use up the heat, it wants to shift in the forward direction, because then heat is a reactant, it would get used up. If it were to shift backwards, it would be producing some heat, which would cause the temperature to go up even more, which is not what we want to do. So there'll be a forward reaction shift, and the amount of SO3 would decrease. From a Q perspective, um, it's a little bit tricky here. What you have to remember is that Kc is affected by temperature. Now, for an endothermic process, like we see in the forward reaction, Kc will get larger when you raise the temperature. It'll get smaller when you lower the temperature. So if we were to raise the temperature here by heating the system, Kc gets larger. Since Kc is larger, Q is going to be smaller than K, and that means there'll be a forward shift. Now again, Kc gets larger because this reaction is endothermic. If this were an exothermic process, heat was on the right-hand side, then raising temperature would have the opposite effect. Kc would have gotten smaller, and now Q would be bigger than K, and there would have been a reverse shift. So you have to remember this, that when you have an endothermic process, Kc gets larger when temperature goes up, for an exothermic process, Kc gets smaller when temperature goes up. Now from a kinetics perspective, raising the temperature would cause both the forward and reverse reactions to speed up. However, the endothermic direction, in this case the forward direction, would increase with a greater amount than the reverse exothermic process. So they f again, you'd result in a forward shift and there'll be less SO3 in the system. If we reduce the volume of the container by half, in a non-AP perspective, we would argue that that causes the pressure inside the system to go up. Boyle's law from grade 11 chemistry, when you lower the volume, you raise the pressure. Now what we're going to argue is the system wants to reduce the pressure. And to do that, we look at the balanced equation and we count moles of gas. Notice that there are three moles of gas on the left-hand side, one mole of CO2 and two moles of SO3, but there's four moles of gas on the right-hand side. I'm ignoring the CS2 because it's a solid. If the pressure goes up, the system will try to reduce the pressure, and it will reduce the pressure by reducing the amount of gas. When you have more gas in the container, the pressure is higher, so when you have less gas, the pressure will go down. So since we want to reduce the pressure, there'll be a reverse shift so that the 4 moles become 3 moles, which is lowering the amount of gas. A reverse shift means we're going to make more SO3 in the end. Now, what, how would one explain that from a... Uh, AP exam perspective. Well, you could look at the expression for Q, and you could argue that when the, pre when the volume was reduced, all of the concentrations increased. Now, the denominator of this expression has a total exponents of 1 and 2, so it's being cubed, while the numerator is raised to the power of 4. Therefore, increasing the concentrations will have a greater effect on the numerator, which is being raised to the power of 4, so therefore, Q is going to get larger, Q will be larger than K, there'll be a reverse shift, and you'll make more SO3. From a kinetics perspective, you'd argue something similarly. You'd say that all of the concentrations go up, therefore the forward and reverse rates go up, but because the forward rate is um, over, over, overall order of 3, the 1 and the 2, while the reverse rate, rate law would be an overall order of 4, the reverse rate will increase more than the forward rate. There will be a reverse shift to the equilibrium. If you add a catalyst, catalysts speed up both the forward and reverse reactions. 
they lower the activation energy which causes both the forward and reverse reaction rates to increase and not quite as obvious but it can be proven it increases them the same amount so they increase by the same factor therefore there's no shift in equilibrium so catalysts cause both the forward and reverse reaction rates to increase by the same amount, therefore they cause no shift in equilibrium, the amount of SO3 does not change. If you add some helium to the system, now if you understood what we talked about with the volume change of the vessel, you might, th you might fall into a bit of a trap with helium because adding some more helium does cause the total pressure in the system to go up. We know from Dalton's law in grade 11 chemistry, the total pressure in a mixture of gases like this will be the pressure of the CO2 plus the pressure of the SO3 plus the pressure of the oxygen. And now we're going to add helium, so there's another pressure, pressure of helium. So the total pressure goes up. However, the amount it goes up is simply due to the extra helium. The three original pressures are unaffected by the additional helium. Helium doesn't react with anything in the container, so none of the pressures will change that were already there. Therefore, Q is unaffected, therefore Kc and Q are still equal. There's no shift in equilibrium. So although the total pressure goes up, none of the pressures that were there change. Q is unaffected, and therefore there's no change in equilibrium. The helium has no effect on the concentrations of the, of the reactants or products, therefore the rates of the forward or reverse reactions are unaffected. There's a way to explain it from a kinetics perspective. So I hope that helps with uh, Le Chatelier's principle. We'll post another, another video for some more practice as well.